and welcome to another Jew and Gentile podcast. I am your host, Chris Katolka, and with me is none other than the Jewish sage himself, the one, the only, Mr. Steve Herzig. How are you, sir? I am doing great, Chris. I see a cup of coffee in front of me. Oh, we got a cup of coffee, and you know what else you have? We have leftover Passover. We have, I had to wash out two of our cups from uh, the Passover. I did that yesterday and helped to clear up a little bit, brought my stuff back home because I'm on my way to Indiana to do another Passover. That's right, and I'm on my way to Florida to do a Passover, and we've got grape juice, we've got all the great Passover stuff in the pass in this uh, podcast room. Hold on a minute, here we go. That's right, Steve and I are traveling. We're getting ready to go. You're leaving tomorrow. I am. And I'm leaving on Thursday for a uh, Passover. Um, I'll be down at uh, First Baptist Church of Pensacola, Florida. Nice. And where are you going? I'm in Napanee, Indiana. Napanee, Indiana. Okay. Yep. Now, Chris. Yes. I just found out something. And actually, it was your coffee that kind of caught my eye and stimulated my mind. That's, That's a dangerous thing. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, yesterday, I found out that about eight years ago, was it eight years I ago? I think it was nine years nine ago. Nine years ago, a young Chris Katolka, mm-hmm. who had traveled to Israel and fallen in love with Turkish coffee. It's true. It's so, very true. So you did a video that has been seen by how many people? 14,000 people. Four t- and I wasn't now one of them. That's now over- I am. Now I am, now but you I are. didn't. Mm-hmm. It, I don't know if it moved the notch up at all. It probably didn't move it at all. But I want us to put it in the show notes. Okay. We're going to put a link in the show notes. Do you know how to access the show notes when you... I actually have done it once. Okay, good. I have done it once. Be- it's the scrolling that gets me. You got to scroll down. Scroll you- down. Once you scroll down... Then it's not too bad. I apologize. I shouldn't have assumed something so simple would Especially be so complex. Especially with a person aye, like aye, me. Aye, aye. You're amazing. But, but we found, I found out that you did a video, uh, a blog that is actually on our website, FOI's website. FOI's YouTube page. YouTube page. Yeah, they're not putting our, I'm not, I haven't made that status yet. Okay. Of okay. the website. So it's, it's online, but you're going to give them a link. But it's you... Teaching people how to do Turkish coffee. That's right. You have a shorter beard. My beard is and basically more hair. Exactly. So, hair, I, so if you watch it for no other reason, see the younger, shorter beard, longer, and more <laughs> hair follicles that are filled up right. in Chris Katolka. Well, I think you wanted me to play some of this. I did. I you know did. you are my boss. So when you tell me that there are moments in the inflection in your voice that say. This is something you're going to do. Because at me, I said, ah, I'll just put the link in there. And you you were like, no, we're going to play it. We're going to play it. I want Zyga our seven Zen. listeners to have access to how you got started. This was a early career of Chris Katolka. Maybe I should have been on the Food Network. You this I, I watched the whole vi- You could be on the Food Network. I feel like maybe I had two options, Jewish ministry or Food Network. I'm glad the Lord <laughs> led you into the latter. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Uh, courtesy of Steve Herzig, uh, wanting to show you me early on doing a, uh, a, a an explanation of how to make Turkish coffee. Here we go. Oh, see, nothing's ever smooth. There we go. Right now, and as the grinds fall to the bottom of the cup, they <laughs> filter out the coffee flavor. It's true. Both the coffee and the cardamom working together. Cardamom. It'll be another five minutes before this cup of coffee. You gotta ready. wait for but the I'm coffee. Tell you something. It's worth. You see? There you go. Well, it's all done. All the grinds have settled to the bottom. And now, we just have wonderful Turkish coffee. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. I'm telling you, we're going to take it from 14,000 to 14,010. That's... (laughs) <laughs> That's exactly right. Where's the other three listeners coming uh, in from? Somebody else is going to stumble on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. If you want to watch the whole video on how to make Turkish coffee, go for it. I still love Turkish coffee. It's when you're walking through the old city of Jerusalem, and there's usually an old man that's sitting outside. Uh, they rotate old men, you know, uh, sitting outside. Easy to do. Easy to do. Um, sitting outside the Damascus Gate, and he's got this big, giant, 
bubbling boiler thing that's got a, a gas heater and it's heating up the water and he pops that thing on there really quick. He throws in some sugar, some water, and in three seconds and five shekels later, you've got yourself a one of, honestly, the best cup of Turkish coffee. It, I've tried to buy the coffee. When you're going through the old city, there are some coffee grinding or coffee uh, places that you can buy it. It just is never the same as the the guy that's been doing it his whole life. Get you know five shekels later. Plus, it's been in the same container for all that time, so it it's, it keeps a little of the taste. A hundred percent. So, and it's got that cardamom in it, and he puts a little sugar. I don't usually drink sugar in my coffee. I just I, in the in the video I mentioned I just always drink black coffee. Yeah, you put two scoops in there. Two scoops because it it uh, it's a very strong bitter coffee, but they put that. Uh, Cardamom, cardamom in it. Oh, it's amazing. I love well, it. Well, our listeners get a chance to get that recipe and do it themselves. Although you told me that the mechanism, that container that you put the uh, coffee grinds in is now a pencil holder. That's <laughs> that's what nine years can do. <laughs> nine years, marriage and kids. That's right. All of a sudden, the kids need a place to put pencils. Boom. There, there it is. There, there you go. There you go. Uh, Steve, um, uh, you know, we've been talking about Passover. We did a Passover last week. For FOI Equip, a, a great success. We had probably about 150 people, 150, 60 people tune in. And I know it was that number because we had about 120 log in to watch. And then there were groups of 30 and 20. Yep, that's 50 right there for two computers. Exactly. And so I don't know if I'm doing my math right. I'm sure some guys going, Chris, none of that makes sense. Well, Zygazen. All I'm going to say is we had a great group of people. They all logged on, and we did a Passover right here, right from the Jew and Gentile podcast, which you'll be able to watch online as well. Uh, and then we're all – I'm already moving on to my fifth Passover coming up next uh, Wednesday. Uh, I'll be doing my fifth Passover of the year. What, you're working on two or three? I think this is two. Yeah. Two. But I back in the day, uh, I used to do Passover. I've done, I used to do them every year, every month of the year. Oh, yeah. 100%. Churches ask for it all the time, and they should, because it's as we said last week when we did our Passover, if you want to understand communion, you got to have a Passover. 100%. Um, can I say, too, uh, I have good news. So maybe our listeners know about our program called Bridges, and Bridges is nine weeks of free Jewish ministry training. And all you have to do is meet one night a week, do a little bit of reading, a little bit of watching, bada bing, bada boom, you're a graduate after nine weeks. It's a, And it's free. I can't stress that enough. Free, 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 free. And so uh, on April 2nd, our very first Bridges of the Year is starting, which is awesome. And you can, if you're listening right now and you're going, I'd love to do that. Well, hurry up, go to foi.org forward slash Bridges, and you can register today to take it. But here's the good news is that we have a Tikva volunteer, a Friends of Israel Tikva volunteer. He's a pastor, Roland Newdecker, in Germany. In Germany. And he says, I want to host a Bridges. And he's already got three people signed up in Germany to take the class. And there's like more waiting in the wings for the next uh, sessions. So we're we're, exp we're expanding. We're, we're what is that called? Uh, we're scaling it. We're doing whatever. We have them in the UK. We have it in Germany. We have people hey, logging in from Chris, all over. You got Bruce to be able to speak German. <laughs> I did. How did you do that? I used AI. He did a. I, I you showed you played a little for me, and it was a lot of hachen and hachen and yichen. Uh, it was German, and he, and boy, Bruce sounded. How did you get him to learn? Uh, German so quickly. Well, you know how smart Bruce is. Bruce he, is very smart. He is very smart. Uh, he he did Polish too. But there's a there's a uh, AI technology that will take your video. AI technology. We're going to talk about that a little later in the program. It will take your video of you teaching or saying anything, and it will translate it into the language. It will make your mouth look like you're saying it, and then it will be your voice. That's what's weird. So I sent it to Roland. I said, "Does this sound good?" He goes. This is actually very impressive. He goes, there's a couple words that, you know, we, but I understand it. It's easy to understand. I sent the Polish one to Timothy in Poland, and he says, he laughed, ha, 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 very impressive. <laughs> so anyway, uh, all I want to say is if, if you're thinking about, man, Jewish ministry, I have a Jewish friend, I have a Jewish cousin, I have a Jewish doctor, whatever, and I just would love to find a way to best minister to them. I encourage you to go to Bridges. It's for anybody to take. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you love Israel and Jewish people, 
take bridges. And you can go to foi.org forward slash bridges. And there you can register either starting April 2nd, or we have two more classes coming up, one in the summer and one in the fall. And it's all under equip. And equip is the uh, the means by which all these things, including the Jew and the Gentile podcast, come to folks. A hundred percent. Equip is our sponsor. And uh, so this is great. This is a uh, very interesting. Can people contact us, the seven listeners we have? Although, Chris, I was down in a church, South Jersey, and Mimi came up to me. I don't know, Mimi, if you're going to be listening or you're listening <laughs> now, but she said, just so you know, I'm your eighth listener. I'm your eighth <laughs> listener. So I said, thank you. It's good, but we're still going with seven and praying that other people come in. Well, I had I was up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, speaking at a church, and a very awesome couple, uh, Matt and Kristen, uh, They I know them from uh, Word of Life. Uh, Kristen and her kids came down to nine hours. They drove from Michigan to Wilkes-Barre to, to hear uh, glutton for punishment. I'm telling you to come and to be a part of the Passover that we did. And so Matt, her husband wasn't there. Hey, Matt, this is a big shout out for you. Um, but uh, Kristen says, I'm bringing Chris some candy from Michigan gummies, like gummy bears. And Matt goes, he won't eat those. And, and she goes, why? He goes, don't you listen to the podcast? <laughs> Chris isn't eating sugar right now. <laughs> So anyway, big shout out uh, to the Robinsons. So uh, thankful for them and and their uh, kindness to us as well. Steve, are we going with um, or as we transition here? Are we going with uh, with Menno or are we going with Emily Stone? We're going first with Menno. Okay, good. and then we'll go to Emily Stone. Did you know? And the reason we're, we've been going through Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. And, uh, and I people know people have been texting yes, us. People have told us their purchase. They've purchased the book. I think it's fantastic. Uh, if you are going to sign up for Bridges, which we encourage you to do, if you read this book, you will you will have some insights into the training that you're going to receive. Mm -hmm. And Chris, uh, we've gone through the book of Daniel. Uh, we've alluded uh, to Daniel chapter nine on a, on a couple different podcasts. And so we skipped over, not because it's not important. And in fact, I want to highlight Daniel 9, uh, 24 to 27, with a chart that Menno produced, which is just explains everything really well concerning the prophecy when Messiah is cut off. Mm -hmm. That's what the text tells us in Daniel chapter 9. And in fact, the 70 weeks lead up from 445 B.C., to the crucifixion where Jesus is crucified, the exact number of days. And so for our podcast purpose, we're not going to go through that, but I will recommend getting Menno's book, reading the, the part uh, that where he covers Daniel chapter 9, much better than you and I did right. in Matthew 9, 24 to 27. We should get Menno on to go through we should. the 70s. We week. should. That'll be a bonus. We'll get him to come, a bonus for us. But this chart does start off in 445 B.C., goes through the first seven weeks of years, which is 49 years, uh, to the, uh, the temple, uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and then the 62 uh, weeks, which makes 69, when Jesus is crucified. And Chris, as we're doing this podcast, we're right before Easter, mm -hmm. Resurrection Day, and uh, certainly Passover is where he celebrated, we talked about that, celebrated eating a lamb as we remember Exodus, as he remembered Exodus, but then he became the Passover lamb for us. And then, of course, the 70th week, which we've talked about as well, is a future week of seven years that is yet to take place. The rapture takes place, and then shortly after, uh, we have the, uh, the seven, 70th week. You just went through it. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, but very like, quickly. We don't have time for that. Yeah. But I'm going to go through it. Well, no, very quickly. But what we're going to do, Chris, uh, is go to the next chapter. We're in chapter nine of Menno's book. Okay. And it's titled The Servant of the Lord, a study of Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 53, verse 12. I'm going to ask that you start in chapter 52, verse 13, and just go to the end of the chapter. Got it. It says this in Isaiah chapter 52, starting in verse 13. See, 
My servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations uh, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Okay, so Daniel takes us, as we talked about, to the date of the crucifixion, as Messiah was come to be cut off. That's right. Now we're coming to Isaiah. Chris, the, these, this passage, starting in the end of 52 and going all the way through Isaiah 53, I've never met a Jewish person who has come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah that doesn't have these verses as part of their testimony. Never mm -hmm. have met them. Uh, and it is so significant. When I was growing up, I read, uh, we were learning just in the infancy, we had what was called a chumash. A chumash had the five books of Moses in Hebrew. I've, it all was in Hebrew. And then at the bottom, it had Rashi's commentary. Much like uh, when I first became a Christian, I had a Schofield Bible. That's right. English. Yep. At the top was the text, and at the bottom were Schofield's notes. And so many Christians know study Bibles. Uh, actually, we invented that. Jewish people invented the study Bible. That's right. Because you have the text, and then you have Rashi. And Rashi was so influential because, as Menno writes, he's going to tell us that the normal understanding of Isaiah 52 and 53 was it's the servant of the Lord is the Messiah. The messi That's right. It's a messianic passage. It's a messianic passage. It was unanimous until Rashi. Rashi changed it, and he was so influential, unbeknownst to me uh, as a youngster, I'm Rashi is like the person. He's the study Bible. He's the one we listen to. And it was Rashi who went against the grain, much to his uh, peers who disagreed with him. So the I, he changed it to Israel. And so, Chris, I know you've had this experience. I have too. Many, Maybe some of our listeners have. You, you ask a Jewish person to read from the text, from Isaiah 52 or 53, and what do they say, Chris? Who is it? Stop uh, reading this New Testament to me. Well, no, they think they, it's Jesus. Yeah, but they think it's Jesus. They they always identify, but they say it isn't Jesus. Who do they tell you it is? They tell you it's Israel. Israel, and that's exactly what Rashi said. Well, no, and so maybe it's good to back up too. There are other suffering, or there are there are other servant. Other servant hundred percent passages in Isaiah, lots of them that lots. are associated with Israel, hundred percent. And Menno will address those. Yep, uh, he lists all the verses that where Israel is the servant. He even tells us uh, and talks about Cyrus, Cyrus who commanded or gave the opportunity for the Jewish people to go back to the land. He's called the Anointed One, yeah, the Messiah. So yes. So all that does is drive us right back, Chris, to what you and I have talked about so many times, context. What is the context of whatever you're reading about? Do you think Rashi changed the, the, the in, in his commentary, changed the theological understanding of Isaiah 52 and 53? Because he's writing, I just wanted to double check, Rashi writes. Well, you're going to be a good point. A excellent point. Go ahead. Rashi's writing. He was born in 1040 AD and died in 1105 uh, AD. So he's writing in a time period, a medieval time period, where Christianity has spread. It's. I'm sure that there are Christian theologians that have waxed eloquently on Isaiah 52 and 53 being Jesus. It, like you said, when 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 you read through Isaiah 52 and 53. To a Jewish person, they say, that's Jesus. Stop talking. To, you know, I don't want to talk about that. Do you think he changed it, you know, during this time period because of the influence of Christianity on, no, on Judaism? No question. I, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind. Uh, and it's uh, it's brought out by most uh, exege exegetators, exegetists? Exegetes. Exegetes. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, if you're going to be honest with the text, you have to go back to why did Rashi say this? Well, he said it 
not because uh, uh, of the Holocaust. He said it because of the Crusades. That's right. And it's understandable, but it was 100%. He looks at his current situation and changes it, and that's what has happened in modern Judaism. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, did you know, and we're going to find out that even the view of the afterlife is going to be changed by Reformed Jews who discount the belief that Judaism has had biblically for years. Yeah. They change it because of the circumstances. And that's where, practically, Chris, for you and I, it can happen to us. We read a text and we say, well, we can't do that now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it's not the same now. Well, that's okay to ask or to think about, but the text is the text. And we, as evangelical Christians, say, if something is out of whack, it's not the text. It could be us. We're out of whack. Yeah. And so we have to figure it out. But it's fair enough. The, the identity of the servant in, this, uh, in these passages are critical in an understanding. And the reason why Jewish people have a hard time with understanding or accepting this, uh, usually what happens, oh, I'm going to ask my rabbi. I know what I'm thinking, but I could be wrong. I'm going to ask my rabbi. Then they come back. Uh, and this is in all cases, but many, they come back and say, oh, Rabbi said it's Israel. I'm okay with that. Makes sense to me. And off we go. But by the way, it's not limited to Jewish people. I've, ha I've had people say, I'm going to talk to my priest. Yep. I, I don't agree with this. I it goes back to the priest, uh, because what do we say? Jesus Christ alone, not the church. The church is not sovereign. God is sovereign. The word is living. And powerful. Oh, the priest told me this. We, I've had people say, I'm going to talk to my reverend. Yeah. Uh, and if he's not an evangelical, but just religious, and the church doesn't believe in the inerrancy of the scripture, what will happen? He has an answer. They go to somebody who looks, they got the right clothing, they got the right degree, and if the degree, it trumps the text. That's right. And that's why you and I uh, and Menno, friends of Israel, and any person who goes to an evangelical church that upholds the Word of God is going to say, "Well, wait a minute. We have to, we have to let God be the one who wins." Steve, a couple of weeks ago, I did a full hour interview on um, Jim Schneider's show, which is called Crosstalk. It's a nationwide uh, radio show. Um, he does a great job. He has friends of Israel on often, and at the very end, they take questions. And this, bear in mind, this is this is kind of more. We, we talk about what's going on in Israel. So it's kind of got the, you know, looking at the um, culture, looking at what's going on in politics, and then filtering it through a biblical worldview. That's what the show is basically all about. And so he'll have me on. And I was impressed because there were Jewish people that weren't Christians that listened to his show. And it's predominantly, a, it is a Christian show. It's on VCY, which is a Christian network. All that to say, a Jewish guy calls in, and he we're talking, 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 and he asks a question. And I say, can I just encourage you to do one thing? On national radio, I say, can I encourage you to do one thing? He goes, what? I say, Re read Isaiah 53. Please, just read Isaiah 53. He goes, I'll do it, but then I'm going to go talk to my rabbi. And I said, that's fine. Then another Jewish guy emails me and says, can we chat? And he, want, he goes, why did you ask him to read Isaiah 53? And I said, because that's where the Messiah is seen. That's where G you can see Jesus in Isaiah 53. And then he went into this whole, you know, other he took it the, the, the direction that what uh, Rashi went. The suffering servant is not Jesus. Very popular. It's Israel. So yep. anyway, that was something yep. interesting. Yep. But but again, and by the way, we welcome that kind of thing. That the reason Menno wrote this book. He remember Chris. Uh, this is translated into English. I don't think they used AI. I don't know who they use. Uh, <laughs> he wrote it in Hebrew. Yeah. He was writing this to his people in Israel. It's Hebrew. Uh, but he knew in writing it that it would be a help whether the Jewish people are in France, so I think it's translated into French, or English here in America, because, look, from a Jewish point of view, number one, you have to go with, this, with the Word of God, and number two, you have to look at prophecy. Mm -hmm. Prophecy, I, that's how I got saved. I came to know Christ through prophecy. We always think of prophecy as the end times. Well, when Isaiah wrote, he wrote 700 years before 
the Messiah came. Mm -hmm. That's prophetic. And so today, uh, in now, Jewish people, whether they believe or not, many have been exposed to that text, and they have to deal with Jesus in just the way when they had to deal with him live when he was on the earth. Yep. And, and we talk, well, you and I have talked about that uh, last Sunday from wh when we are recording. So it was last Sunday was Palm Sunday. And what did you tell me about, you know, people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. But they were his homies, yep. weren't they? they, they were, I love that you use that word. They were his homies. Uh, Jesus had two audiences at the what we call the triumphal entry. I, I think that's a bad title for the event. Because Jesus has two audiences. He makes that trek all the way from Galilee down. In, and it's a long trek it, to walk. It's a three-day walk for the most part. And then you got to trek uphill, uh, you know, to make the Aliyah to go up. And so he comes down with his disciples. He brings a crowd with him to Jerusalem. They all are following him. They all He's, con he's convinced them that he's the Messiah. So who are the people in Jer you know, as he's coming down the Kidron Valley and in, in Jerusalem, who are the people laying the branches, putting the cloak, their their, their jackets down or, or their, their cloaks down? And who are the ones, you know, screaming Hosanna in the highest as he's coming down, fulfilling Zechariah 9-9? Well, it's all the people that followed him down. They're the ones. They've, they've been doing that the whole way down. Um, but then if you look, there's a different audience inside the walls of Jerusalem. And the, those, that's the Jerusalemites. Jesus didn't have much interaction with the Jerusalemites. And so... They're looking out going, what's going on out there? So they're looking from the walls out of Jerusalem down to the Kidron. Who's down there? What's going on? And they're shocked. And the text actually says they're shocked. They're, they're kind of worried. What are they worried about? Is this the Messiah? Is this him? You know, I better get myself together. But then what happens is they say, who is this guy? And the response is what shows that it's really not that great of a triumphal entry. They say, oh, it's just a prophet. He, there's two messages going on here. One screaming he's the Messiah. The other saying, don't worry, it's just a prophet. Look, at prophets were a dime a dozen back then. Everyone, you know, was listening to a prophet. Uh, anybody who talked and said, word of the Lord, the only thing that made him a prophet was that it would come true. And so here, oh, he's just a prophet. Two different messages. It wasn't a triumphal entry. Jesus' triumphal entry will be when he returns, his second coming, and he marches into Jerusalem, and every knee bows, and every tongue confesses that he's the Messiah, the Lord, the King, that's a triumphal entry. This was a rejection. None the, and, and great explanation. And so, Chris, we're going to take some time uh, to go through this because it is a pivotal text. Uh, let me just read uh, on the top of page 124 from Menno's book. It says, the verses we are about to study deal with the most important message of the Word of God, mm. the salvation of man and the restoration of his holy and eternal relationship with God. Mm. This is a pivotal time, and I think it's appropriate, Chris, that we are studying it, not because we planned it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. It just It's the providence of God. He that, planned it. That, it's it, like the book of Esther. That's a right. A coincidence that's from above. That's right. And you and I actually had a coincidence like this because I did a Passover for a Faith Bible Church, and you did a Purim for Faith Bible Church just a few days apart. That's right. So, that's right. Anyway, here we are. We're in Isaiah 52. Um, I think we should, Steve, probably look for today at verses 13 through 15 of the—and then I guess next week we can we can dive into Isaiah 53. Yep. Um, but there's a transition that happens here. Uh, where we're seeing both suffering and glory. Suffering and glory matched up together um, as the prophet Isaiah is prophesying about the, the suffering servant. And it says, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. So again, it almost, you know how sometimes, Steve, the story uh, or a movie starts at the end? It will show you a glimpse of the end and then it will go back and tell you yep. how they got there. Yep. That's what Isaiah 52, verse 13 is doing. See, my servant will act wisely. Number one, with wisdom. Uh, that's very important, which means he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about others. Uh, he's thinking godly, godly wisdom. And he will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. So it's the end of the story. He will be raised up, resurrection. He will be lifted up for all to see. And he will be highly exalted, which is his, um, I, I believe, 
his um, ascension into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, that he's highly exalted, uh, that, you know, the name above names, uh, the king of kings, that kind of exaltation, but that came with suffering. And so that's where the story, it actually, I kind of gives a, a picture of, hey, this is what's going to happen, but let me tell you how we get from that glory. Let me tell you how we get there, because the glory didn't come without suffering. That's the point. And in fact, if you think about those words, there's a contrast in the book of Isaiah. There's, as you've highlighted correctly, exalted, extolled, high, lifted up. That's the way God sees him. God sees him that way, except in the context of when we start in Isaiah 53, it's going to be the direct opposite. That's this right. person is going to be humiliated. He's going to be beaten to a pulp. It's He is humbled. And what uh, we should talk about is God highly exalts him. What has happened when man highly exalts himself? Yeah. Oh, there are numerous examples uh, biblically where uh, when man exalts himself, God has to deal with him. Uh, the, the top of my head, the best example is Nebuchadnezzar, not even a Jewish guy, but he, he thought he was a, a big macher, uh, <laughs> and he ends up eating grass for a while. Who, who else do we know of? Uh, in Isaiah, we're told in chapter 14 that Lucifer, a great angel, the top of all the angels, the big macher of all angels, he wants to be equal with God, and he's going to be thrown down. Humbled. Humbled. Mm -hmm. And and so we're, Isaiah is really warning us and giving us a contrast between how God views this servant. He is lifted up. He is exalted. He is on high. We better be careful that we don't think that of ourselves and that the servant he's bringing uh, to us is going to be uh, humbled uh, but he doesn't deserve to be humiliated. It is always it is always interesting to think about, uh, you, you know, somebody who lives two thousand years apart from what happened, the Jesus's birth, how he did ministry, all of these things. You know, you can look back and say, why didn't they see it? But then at the same time, you, I always, I, I don't just throw the Jewish people under the bus. You know, there were yes, Jesus did do things a hundred percent that should have made them go, whoa, you know, like this guy, he's not your average Jewish guy. At the same time, you know, when you're expecting a king to come on the scene, you're not expecting somebody to come from a such a humble, humble background. You can show them all the pedigree you could possibly imagine. But in that day and age, kingship was not the way that we, you know, uh, the kingship came from from a pedigree. It came from a from uh, 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 wealth, influence, power, all of these things. And Jesus has to challenge all of that to his disciples because he'll even say to them, stop thinking like the Gentiles. You're thinking about this all backwards. Uh, Jesus, you know, yes, he even had, when we talk about humble beginnings, I mean, the, even from his very b birth, it was humble. And wouldn't you say it was difficult when he, in Luke, when he uh, goes to, makes Aliyah, comes to the platform and reads the text? He's from Nazareth. <laughs> That's right. These people knew him, and he's reading the text that it's fulfilled. And they, they don't believe him because what their eyes see is the little boy that grew up. And remember, they're in a smaller community. Everybody knows oh, one yeah. another. They knew it was, it. That was social media back then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so, yes, it, there is a lot to overcome when you're confronted with truth, mm -hmm. um, so that's why it is so difficult. I, I don't. We don't want to make it uh, or come across as though you read this once and that's it. Oh, bada bing, bada boom. I believe. No, there's stuff to overcome. Yeah, uh, and you and you have to deal with it. But for the person who reads with a, a heart to learn. His word doesn't return empty. Mm -hmm. It doesn't return it. Isaiah says that, but that doesn't. You got to struggle. People have to struggle, and that's not limited to Jewish people. That's limited to all. Not limited. It's everybody. Yeah. And in fact, one of the news items we're going to talk about actually communicates to us that people are less inclined to look at the word, less inclined to. Go and find out if this is true. We have institutions, religious institutions. We we call them the church, and there's all different branches, and there's Islam, and there's Judaism, and there's 
Buddhism. People are wanting to know what the truth is. But Chris, as we'll find out when we go over that news item, we're going to find out that people are less inclined. They're so frustrated with the culture that we're in. There's less desire to know the truth, or even if there is such a thing as the truth. Exactly. And so you know, we're going to be looking at that in the news. But really, Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, set up the—it's a bracketed account of what we're about to read in Isaiah 53. No question. Because we see that this one is highly exalted, raised up, lifted up, extolled, as Steve said. Uh, but it says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Again, the suffering that the suffering servant uh, would go through. And we see that in Jesus's um, uh, crucifixion, in his trial, uh, in, in, in the way that the Romans treated him, in the way that the, the Sanhedrin treated him, uh, that in just a few hours between the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, and and the cross, uh, Jesus goes uh, before Pontius Pilate, and then he's ultimately beaten beyond uh, appearance. They couldn't even recognize him. Um, and so again, something that Isaiah fifty three saw. Um, and but it says this: in that he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Again, it's this. Uh, if, if you can think about it like this, we start off, this guy's highly exalted. He is, uh, uh, he'll be lifted up, all of these amazing attributes. But then what happens is it comes with suffering. And then after the suffering, people will see, even the kings will see that this was one uh, that, uh, that, um, that, that will sprinkle the nations. There's this global picture of what the, what the Messiah would do in his suffering. And all of that little, these three verses are going to set us up for the direction uh, that Isaiah is taking us in Isaiah 53. You know, Chris, you start the Bible in Genesis, and you see Adam in a garden. He's innocent. You fast forward uh, to Jesus right before uh, he uh, goes to the cross to become a lamb. Where is he? He's in a garden. Mm -hmm. He's in a garden. And now he's in a garden, and he is anguished, anguished. Uh, he faces a cup of wrath uh, where he will become sin. That's what this. That's what Isaiah 53 is going to talk about. And I've been thinking about that this week. And can you imagine? I, I can't imagine because we're with sin. He's without sin. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say he committed sin. It says he became sin. So as he faced Calvary, was his humanity... Uh, challenged by the pain that he knew he would have to go through? I I'm sure. I wonder if it wasn't far more than that, taking every single sin from every single individual, past, present, and for us who are in the future of that, uh, that caused him to sweat drops of blood. It's just an interesting contrast, the two gardens. Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm glad you brought that this up because... Uh I did a radio program on that's going to air this weekend for Easter on Psalm 22. And I, my argument was that Jesus walked the path of Psalm 22. But sometimes we only read the moments of Psalm 22 where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, but if you read all of Psalm 22, it's like a conversation that David's having. And the conversation is feeling forsaken, feeling abandoned, feeling alone and wondering, is God out there? But then at the same time, as David is having these, this, 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 the, the, uh, you know, affliction of suffering, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's also the reminder, oh, you haven't forsaken me. Oh, you are faithful to me. You will do this. But I feel alone. I feel rejected. I feel all these things. I, the, my enemies are surrounding me, but I know that you'll be with me. And I think Jesus, that's where the wisdom and the, and the, uh, uh, Jesus's, um, obedience was grounded in in Psalm 22 that he knows he's going to be forsaken. I, I really believe, and, and I, when when we stand two thousand years apart again, it's easy, and and we have theology, we have doctrine, we can look back and say Jesus is a hundred percent God. You know, uh, he was destined for the cross. But what the Garden of Gethsemane shows us is that Jesus was scared. He was scared. Why? Because he was one hundred percent human. 
As much as he was 100% God, he was 100% human. And the Garden of Gethsemane is two Hebrew words, Gat Shmanim, the place of pressing. Jesus was next to the olive press. And Steve, you and I have seen ancient olive presses. Yes, we have. They squeeze every ounce of oil out of those olives. There's nothing left but pulp. I mean, the thing, it's dry pulp. It's fitting that Jesus is sweating blood in the place of pressing because every ounce of his humanity is being pressed. It's being pressed spiritually, understanding what's coming at Calvary, but it's also being pressed, I think, in a human sense of, Lord, if I if this cup can pass, please let it let this happen. That's the humanity. That's the humanity. But here's the here's the obedience. But your will be done. That's right. That's where Adam failed. Instead of going, man, that apple looks great, or the, the, the forbidden fruit, man, that looks great. But your will be done. That that is the the nip it in the bud <laughs> understanding of what Christ's mission was all about. The first Adam failed. Hundred percent man. Obviously, he's man. Uh, and he 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 is tempted and he falls. He failed. He even though he walked with God, God showed him what He showed him in the garden. He failed. Jesus is the last Adam. He's the he's the one that has to fix what the first Adam failed to do. And he's at a critical point in the program. And his humanity, just as you said, said, "Oh man, is there any other way?" Mm-hmm. Steve, but, sometimes when I'm on an airplane and that thing starts bumping around, I grab my seat like it's going to do something. And I think this could be it. Yep. You know, I, I'm perfect, perfectly fine. I'm there. I am sipping my Diet Coke, you know, going 700 miles an hour. But then I feel a bump and I start to get scared. I can't imagine what it meant for Jesus and all of his humanity to exactly. know what he's facing in that exactly. moment. Exactly. And that's why the context when we uh when we go to our next podcast will be really into Isaiah 53 and we'll see why this is so important for Jewish person or a Gentile person. If you understand Isaiah 53, really get an idea about it. Uh you, you will know who Jesus is. Mm. Mm. All right, Steve. So that's next week. We're going to look right. at Isaiah 53. But now we're going to go to Did You Know? And the reason we're going to do... It's been a while. Yeah. Hello, Emily been... Stone. Well, I, you, we're back to Emily Stone. And the reason I wanted to look it up is because we're right at the precipice of Easter, mm -hmm. Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and resurrection is a Jewish teaching. It's, it's Jewish. It's biblical. And so uh, Emily talks about uh, Olam Haba which is the world to come. And she says, uh, in Hebrew, the world to come or the afterlife is a physical realm that will exist after the Messiah has come and the righteous dead are resurrected to enjoy life number two. <laughs> That's what she says. I believed uh, growing up in an afterlife, but I believed you only could get Gan Eden, which is the other a Hebrew term for the afterlife, by doing many mitzvahs. That's why the righteous are the ones who go into Gan Eden or in the world to come, Olam Haba. And so uh, the, she puts a question in the, there's a box at the bottom of page 69 here. Is there a Jewish hell and does it have air conditioning? That's the, <laughs> that's the headline. Ay, ay, ay. Belief in resurrection of the dead is one of Maimonides' uh, 13 principles of faith, which are also recited, by the way, in synagogue all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the second blessing of the Shimona Esrei prayer, which is recited three times daily, contains several references to resurrection. And then she has a little note here. And Chris, this is where people go their own way. Yeah. And this is a great example. She gives the note, the reform movement, that is the more liberal side of Judaism, which apparently rejects this belief, the belief of an afterlife. That's right. They're Jewish people who go to synagogue, who read from portions of the text, the Bible, reject the idea of resurrection. So they reject this belief, has rewritten the second blessing. That's so they've just decided, you know what? 
we don't believe this. We're doing it a different way. And by the They're way, saying Rambam, thanks, but no thanks. That's right. And then you you say, well, wait a minute. Look, why did the Jewish people do that? Well, I remember reading a headline a number of years ago. Reader's Digest. Uh, this is not a religious publication. Has done a Bible version. And what did they do? They took out everything. This was a few years ago. Everything that the uh, very uh, a biblical expert says was not part of the text. And Chris, it's like, it's like a, yeah. it's like a, a, what's that book that you use in college? To, a Reader's Digest uh, it's of a, the Bible. I, <laughs> it's like they edited half the Bible out. And these are smart people. So anyway, it's it all boils down to. How do you how do you take the text? Yep. And you and I, Chris, friends of Israel, we believe in the whole scripture. A hundred percent. And so, uh, Steve, why don't we move to the news? We've actually got a video before we get to the news. Yes, I found this video. It's about five months ago from this podcast. It's George W. Bush. And I really like it because he's kind of a prophet. You're going to put that link in the show notes for pe- folks to hear the whole interview about three and a half minutes, but he, this is right when the uh, massacre October 7th took place, just horrible things. Mm -hmm. And he kind of forecasts what it's going to be, what's going to happen. He almost, it's as though he was sitting in the interview today. Yeah. And I hope that his opinion hasn't changed either, because that's the problem. That is, and he forecasts that it will, that not his opinion, but that people in the world's opinion will change. Well, here's our former president, George W. Bush. What does the immediate future look like for Israel, in your view? Uh, immediate future doesn't look very bright, <laughs> uh, particularly if <laughs> you're on laughs. the Hamas side. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be chaotic, and it's going to be, look, it's a democracy. And in a democracy, the people's voices matter, and there's going to be a weariness. You watch. The world's going to be, okay, let's negotiate. You know, Israel's got to negotiate. They're not going to negotiate. These people have played played their cards. Mm. They want to kill as many Israelis as they can, and negotiating with killers is not an option for the elected government of Israel. And so we're just going to have to remain steadfast, but it's not going to take long for people. That's gone on too long. Surely there's a way to settle this through negotiations. Both sides are guilty. My view is one side is guilty, and it's not Israel. Mm. Steve, that I mean, that is powerful. He is a, a bit of a prophet, if you will. He is. This was five months ago, Chris, and it's exactly the way he outlined. But by the way, d- don't give him all the credit. You and I said the same thing. Yeah, we knew that uh, eventually the world would turn on, on Israel because it's taken too long, and we know what the United Nations has just done, uh, and the United States. the The thing is, Chris. I believe, and you believe, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, I'll bless those who bless thee and curse him who curseth thee. Do you know what I told my wife when I found out that the United States abstained? They abstained in their vote, which let the vote go through. I said, Alice, I I fear for our country. I don't Mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. Something is going to happen. Well, without trying to be sensational, I came in this morning uh, because as we're recording— it happens to be the day that that giant uh, cargo ship uh, went into the bridge. And so I was talking to my two experts, uh, Sharon and Martha, and Martha said the same thing. She was texting a friend, and then she said, I, I said, I fear for what happens to our country. And she said, I woke up a few hours later, and here is what the 13th largest, uh, uh, what's it called? The port. Port. Uh, senior moment, uh, <laughs> port uh, is is destroyed. It's not going to be used for a while because of this bridge. Mm-hmm. So I can't say one correlates to the other. I wouldn't do that. But I can say that with turning your back on Israel, other countries in biblical history have turned their back on Israel, and other countries in the Bible have blessed Israel. And we all see what happens. You see what happens. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because the reason that we've said it before and George W. Bush could say it confidently is I'm sure uh, our former president is very familiar with the history of Israel uh, and and what's happened to the people uh, and how and how countries have responded to Israel in war. He's probably seen and read all about it and understands it from his inside sources and all that. 
all we have to do is look at the past and go, it's anything to come with Israel and the Jewish people is a cycle. It's a cycle. And we can go, oh, here we are in the circle right now. This is where we are because that's what it is. And so we can look at the, the same thing. When, it, I mean, when America steps back, what's going to happen? Or, or when they sit on the sidelines and abstain and let the world curse Israel, what's going to happen to us? Well, the Bible has shown us over and over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture that when you touch the eye, the, the, the apple of God's eye, you're going to see the ramifications of that. And so, I mean, the bridge thing, who knows what's next? Did you even see, I, I, I found this was interesting. I saw on Twitter or X the other day that um, they were talking about the fact that, uh, isn't it interesting that nobody in the world is looking at how Russia has treated I saw that. The terrorists. They had a picture of the uh the what the Russians did to those people and their uh their shirts are off, their pants are off, they're in their underwear and uh nobody's saying anything. Yeah, they're uncon the one guy's unconscious in the thing and no, no UN resolutions, nothing nothing. nothing. And nothing. Israel, a democracy is fighting a terrorist organization. Oh, but we have to have a UN resolution about that's, this. That's right. It is it is interesting. So Oh, this uh, is fun, Steve. You this is the AI, AI one that you're going we, to next. I, we can, yeah. Okay. I I I uh, found this, and it's you know you don't know whether it's a blessing or a problem. Uh, the headline uh, from the Jerusalem Post is: Jews have always been prolific writers. Has AI wound up with too much of their work? <laughs> Chris, I saw this and said this is amazing because this person did massive research to find out that disproportional writers of knowledge are Jewish. In other words, we're a very small part of the population, and it's worse. Remember, I graduated in the top 10% of the lower third of my class, so I'm not contributing a whole lot in terms of intelligence. But Jews have disproportionate amount of their population where they've given great deal of knowledge that's been loaded into AI. Yep. And without having to give credit to them. And so the article is about, wait a minute, all these, all these things that AI is spitting out when you ask or I ask or whoever asks, it's Jewish, but they're not getting any credit. And it will mean AI might replace some of the Jewish people <laughs> who have contributed. So this whole study is interesting. How, how, how did you react when you saw it? Well, it does make number one. If you think about it, anything biblical is going to be uh, Jewish. So if, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, if they're quoting AI Jesus, AI Jesus is just the Jewish Jesus. You know, <laughs> that's true. So it's all you know. It does it does make good sense what they're talking about. Um, but I'll just read the first paragraph here. Growing up Jewish in New York City, Halia. Purcell absorbed the lesson that education can set you on a path toward personal success and protect against the forces that have marginalized Jews throughout the history, throughout history. I was told by my family and by my culture uh, versions of they can't take that away from they can't take away your education. Investing in education has been tremendously successful strategy for American Jews, Purcell said. Purcell he heeded her childhood lesson and made her way to Boston University, where today she is working on a doctorate in computing and data science. But a research paper she published in partnership with other scholars suggests that the formula for success that countless American Jews like herself have banked on could be in peril. Chris says Jews make up a tiny portion of the population, but have produced so much knowledge that to a worrying degree, the future of AI research relies on them. For one thing, the paper emphasizes that further research would likely confirm that other groups such as Hindu Americans, Asian Americans are also likely overpresented. She said exposing biases that harm Jews often reveals broader issues. We are a canary in the coal mine. Mm, there you go. <laughs> Be disproportionately harmed by intellectual property, dispossession in large language model training. So it's just... You know, everything that happens, there's a reaction. It's if something happens, it's going something else is going to happen as a result. And now we've seen AI is affecting the Jewish people. <laughs> it's AI anti Semitism. There you go. <laughs> all What's right. your next one? The next one is uh they're all yours. You found them. These are great. Uh poll, church attendance declines among US religious groups past several years have reflected on an overall decline in religious service. 
attendance among Americans, according to a data from Gallup. Between 2021 and 2023, 30% of Americans said they attended religious services every week, 21% or almost every uh, or almost every week 9% at the same time only 11% reported attending once a month and 56% said they seldom um or never attend so it's gone down 12 percentage points in 20 years chris it was 42% 20 years ago it's now 30% that's right and i'm assuming uh that the vast ma- the reason for this has probably been the pandemic i I'm not uh, yes, uh, probably the majority of it, but it's always been trending down. Oh yeah, 100%. Always been trending well, down. Well, what it, but what it did is uh, it forced that the pandemic gave permission for people to stay home. And then the churches I, I know this was a struggle for many pastors of of evangelical churches that wanted tushies on the pews. And they said, uh, I wonder how many bulletins had that. Tushies in the pew. Put your tushy in the pew, <laughs> not in your home, you know? And the problem was is that uh, they had to make a decision. Do we turn the camera off? Because they're live streaming. Do we turn the camera off or do we keep it on? Because we are seeing a increase of people, not just in our community, but from all around the world that are tuning into services. And that's a positive thing. Um, so it was a decision that a lot had to make. I've talked to some pastors that say, oh, we turn it on on Sunday evening and turn it off on Sunday morning. I thought that's a good compromise. But most churches have left their live stream on, which gives you permission to stay home. That, I'll tell you, and the the ones who violate it the most are people in my age bracket. Uh, and these are people who have been, gone to church their whole life. But during the pandemic, they had a cup of coffee. They were in their jammy bottoms. They, 100%. They put on a, the ladies put on a blouse. The men put on a shirt. Uh, they kept their bottoms, and they uh, drink coffee, and they watch church. And then it's time to go back. They say, <laughs> I like this. I like it a lot. I like that's, it a lot. You're exactly right. I don't have to talk to anybody. Uh, oh, boy, that's for a, a lot of people yeah. who don't like it. Not you and me. I miss. I wanted to get back. 100%. But there are tons of people say, people make me crazy. Yeah. Uh, no, they just want to be, you know, they like being in their little box in the Zoom box, and that's it. I did wonder during the pandemic if there was, you know, there are people that have social anxieties. You know, they, they get nervous when they're around big groups of people or or maybe they don't feel comfortable introducing themselves. I did wonder if, you know, doing the online Bible study during the pandemic maybe provided an opening for people that might not show up to show up because they can just keep their camera off and participate if they want, you know, but they can come and be a part of a digital community. But I don't think that's the way God made it. Well, you know, Chris, every Wednesday we have chapel here at uh, Friends of Israel, and it's my... Uh, my pleasure, actually. I love doing it. Uh, I'm kind of the MC to gather people around. And, <laughs> and what I do is between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, when people come on, I'll just talk to them. Hey, we're so-and-so is in this place or that place. Some of them don't want to talk. No, they don't. <laughs> they, do, they don't want to. T- and I've had to learn, ooh, I'm sorry, I'll move on to the next box. Yeah. Because they don't want to talk. You know, it is a, it, it is a good uh, it is a good little thing to see how, you know, if if church is just, the participation in church is just sitting and watching. That's it. Yep. If you're just sitting and watching, then your thoughts are, I can just sit and watch from home. But see, if you're involved in your local church, if you're involved in some capacity, now you have to show up. Now you have to be there. And, you know, there are certain denominations where involvement in the church sacraments is very important. Like the brethren community, every week they have the Lord's Supper. They have they break bread. You know, you have to be there for that. You in order to participate in the Lord's Supper, you have to be there. But if you're just an observer of a pastor teaching and the plate going by and the worship, you know, worship, then I can observe this from home. That's an interesting little dynamic. It is. It is very interesting. And uh, Chris, as time continues to go on. In our country, at least, we are the, the culture is continually moving away from the text, continually moving away from any religious kind of observation. A hundred percent. All right, we got one more, Steve. What, th- Chris, this is really important, and I, if for those people who are hearing like glitches, we're having a glitch problem. Yeah, we'll fix uh, that. It's like I'm speaking uh, Hebrew or something. Yeah, exactly. Because I, 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 anyway, it's not me. 
it's our equipment. We'll try to clean it up. Uh, we we don't have a production company that comes in while there's a problem. Exactly. All right. So the headline, again, from the Jerusalem Post is, the government, this is the Israeli government, to vote on new Haredi conscription plan as coalition teeters. Hmm. Chris, this is a major problem. It's been a problem. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has had a problem. He's it, had a pro- it's been a problem for years. Tell us, sum up, what is the problem? All right. So in Israeli, um, in, in when it comes to the Israel Defense Forces, all Israelis, if they're Jewish, they are required to serve in the military. With but an asterisk there. The asterisk is the fact that if you're a ultra-Orthodox, they call them Harardi, if they're ultra-Orthodox, they don't have to serve because they're praying for the country. Actually, that goes back to the very first prime minister, um, who uh, David Ben-Gurion, who told his the, the, the ultra-Orthodox, you don't have to serve. And there was a reason for that. And that's because in Eastern Europe, most of the ultra-Orthodox were, were killed in the Holocaust. And so they they came over and they were saying, look, you don't have to serve because the origins, you know, this is right after the Holocaust, you know, build your community. We have to rebuild the ultra-Orthodox community. Boy, they took that order and ran with it. Here we are <laughs> 75 years later and they're st- now they're angry. And they're angry because, see, the, the, the I don't even want to say the word secular, the non-ultra-Orthodox. You can still be a believer in, yep. in God and not be ultra-Orthodox. Th- those people who have had to serve in the military are upset. And that's your common Israeli person. And so for many, many years now, they've been trying to make a draft, a bill for, for the IDF that all Israelis that are Jewish have to serve. The ultra-Orthodox don't get an exemption. But what has happened is that Netanyahu relies very heavily on the ultra-Orthodox vote, which exactly. pretty much the entire government that he runs, his coalition government, are all made up of ultra-Orthodox people. So you have a split uh, um, uh government on this. And I'll even say this, Steve, this is what really blows my mind is this has been, if you remember when you go back, uh, remember when uh, Netanyahu went to elections like five times in three years? Yep. All of it is grounded in this debate. It's this debate. He lost a, a, um, a partner in his coalition, a different part, a different party, but his name was Lieberman. And Lieberman is a secular Russian Israeli who wants all uh, ultra-Orthodox to serve in the military. And Netanyahu was the prime minister, and he's got to ride the fence. And so he goes, no. And Lieberman says, I'm not voting for you. And he lost a big portion of his government because of that. And so what happens is you've got one side of conservatism saying, no, they have to serve. And the other side of conservatism in Israel saying, no, we are, we're, we're not going to serve. And this is where the battle is. And it could cause Netanyahu his seat as oh, prime minister. I, I think it will, because you not only have the Haredi who are against this legislation, you've got people in his own cabinet who are against because it's not tough enough. That's right. If, if the, the legislation that they want to vote on is 35 years old. They get an extension till they're 35 years old. <laughs> so there's t- in the in the article you can read about they're saying 35 for it's practically impudent now. Yep. Uh no, we have to we have to stiffen it and but then you'll have the ultra orthodox who will pull out as well. So either way, Benjamin Netanyahu is in trouble. Uh he- He's in big trouble. Can I, can I say this too, w- w- with reference? You know, five years ago, or I, I forget, maybe three or four years ago, when Netanyahu found himself in election after election after election after election, that was all prior to October seventh. The conversation is a different conversation now about participation in the military and about the lifeblood of Israel. They need every man, woman. They can get. There's three fronts in Israel that they have to work on. The first is Gaza. The second is the West Bank or Judea Samaria. And the third is Lebanon. And so they can't have people go, ah, we're not going to serve. We're just going to pray for you. No, you got to put your prayers to action now and join the military. That's why I think there's a lot more fervor behind this. No question. And even Benny Gantz, who is a very popular politician in Israel, is saying, I'm leaving this war cabinet if you don't get this problem it's, fixed, it's, Netanyahu. It could very well fall within the next couple of weeks. All right, uh, Steve, that was 
those were great news articles, Steve. Congratulations on doing another job. You're like the uh, you're the collator of great news in Jewish culture. Well, it's custom. not always great news, but <laughs> usually it's not great news. But it is news. It's news, but you do a great job finding the right pieces. But well, Steve, I found another right piece. There you go. I like I, this. I one. went to the. Uh, the mensch of all, when it comes to Yiddish, Jackie Mason. There he is. How uh, to talk Jewish. The late Jewish. Jackie Mason, who, uh, Chris, the word is gahak de lieber. Gahak, gahak de lieber. Gahak de lieber. Okay. Chopped liver. Chopped liver. The expression, we use it in English all the time. What am I? Chop liver? Uh, <laughs> it, it always used in the sense that You've over. You've passed me over. Uh, this isn't good. And so I'll, I'll give you a, an example. You, uh, Jackie says, you see a beautiful girl, and your friend says, what a stunning girl. And you say, so what do you think she was, chopped liver? <laughs> Someone asks, are you making a living? The other person says, what am I, chopped liver? That's right. Chris, as we see Isaiah 53, people think Jesus is is not the Messiah. He could say, what am I, chopped liver? What am I, chopped liver? Look, exactly at, right. look at the text, and you'll know that I am the Messiah of Israel. Amazing. So wait, say it again, Steve. Gahak oh, Talibur. Yeah. Gahak Talibur. Gahak Talibur. All right, everybody. Gahak Talibur. Am I chopped liver? What are we, chopped? Oh. Doing the Gentile podcast. What are we, chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being a part of the Jew and Gentile podcast. Steve and I have to run. We're late for a meeting. Hey, we've got our staff meeting coming up, but we love you so much we wanted to stick around, okay? Hey, listen, be sure to go to foiequip.org, and there you can find, uh, find out how you can participate in all the things that are happening here with the Jew and Gentile podcast, with North American Ministries, and with Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. We want you to participate. You can actually sign up for Steve's upcoming class. That'll be in April on Romans 9 through 11, where he's going to be asking the question, has God forsaken his people? Well, you got to come and find out if that's true or not. God forbid. God forbid. All right, everybody. Hey, we'll see you next week.